So as we kick off, um, I'm very happy and honored actually to pass the mic uh, to one of our newest OVIC members, uh, Ben Marooney, uh, who needs no introduction, <laughs> though I will give him one anyways. Um, he has spent 20 years on Canadian television as an anchor and interviewer to really try and drive forth the message of inclusion in many different ways, as well as to help us wake up uh, in the morning. Um, but on many different notes, he also sits on the board of the Dream Industry uh, REIT, uh, as well as an ambassador for the CNIB and the chair of the board of the Shoebox Project in the US. And most importantly, his new role as co-founder as well as chief communication officer for Orchard Technologies. And as I pass the mic over to Ben, uh, his panel is one of the most exciting panels from today's session. And largely because it is the first time that I'm aware that we are covering all sides of um, Canada in the sense of how open banking can help the needs of Canada by addressing financial barriers for minority groups as well as small businesses. So I pass the mic over to you, Ben. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. I appreciate that. And thank you everybody for joining us here today. I know you were probably shocked at seeing my face here. Um, I was very shocked uh, when I left television and moved into fintech, uh, but uh, very happy to be learning about this new world uh, and happy to be here talking about open banking with you. We've got a great panel and the title of this panel is Ensuring Open Banking Meets the Needs of All Canadians, Addressing Financial Barriers to Minority Groups and Small Businesses. And we've assembled an incredible group of people to talk about just that. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to um, just say the name of the person uh, who's on the panel. We're gonna give them a quick moment to introduce themselves. Uh, and then I've got a few questions, which uh, I may or may not direct to one uh, panelist in particular, uh, maybe one or two. Uh, sometimes a question will be a jump ball. Anybody who wants it can get it. And feel free, obviously, to our panelists that if there's something that you would like to add following the answer of one of our panelists, just come on up with your um, with what you'd like to say as well, and uh, and we'll keep going. And then to uh, all those uh, watching from home, uh, please participate. And just know that we're going to probably keep about ten minutes at the end for questions. Uh, feel free to put those in the chat. I will do my best to write them down. Uh, and we will throw those out to our panelists as well. So, so let's let's start out as well. Ayala was very great at sort of giving us um, um, a state of open banking around the world. Um, I, we know that Canada is perhaps behind the eight ball in some ways. So let's look at the system as it stands in Canada today. What are some of the longstanding banking and payment challenges that BIPOC Canadians, small business, and rural and remote communities have dealt with? And I'd like to, before we get to the question, maybe I should introduce my panelists. Um, Michelle Bayo obviously needs no introduction because she got one earlier. Let's move on to the Honorable Senator Colin Deacon. Um, Senator, uh, anything you'd like to add about why why you came to the Senate and what uh, what does open banking mean to you? Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm a former entrepreneur and and uh, somebody who really believes that the private sector can lead very important changes in our society if the regulatory playing fields are level. Uh, innovators are, can, can come from any corner of our country because they look at problems as opportunities. And uh, that's especially true for those who have been traditionally marginalized in our, in our economy. So for me, that's why I'm in the Senate. That's, that's why I, I, I accepted the, uh, the appointment, uh, because I feel very strongly about this issue. We've got an economy that uh, is like an eight-cylinder engine, but we've only been firing on six cylinders. And uh, that's, that is not just holding back those who have been traditionally not given a full a uh, full chance to succeed in our economy, but it's been holding us all back. And we've got to write, write that ship. We've got to correct that. And, uh, and if we do, we'll have a much more powerful economy and a much more inclusive society. I love that imagery. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, Isaac Oluwalafe Jr. is uh, just a powerhouse. I've had uh, just such a pleasure getting to know him and learn from him. Uh, Isaac, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, it's great to be on this panel. Um, I'm president and CEO of DreamMaker Inc., um, asset management company and founder of Dream Legacy Foundation. And really 10 years ago, 
decided to launch Dream Legacy Foundation to bridge the gap between the, the Black community and underrepresented communities and the institutions. And these institutions include the government, the banking sector, the education sector uh, from an economic point of view. Uh, this is why we've now launched the first Black Tech Incubator out of Ryerson University, the first institutionally backed venture fund for tech and innovation for Black founders, and most recently, the first funding for housing for 200 Black families in partnership with Habitat and Black North. Um, it's great to be on this panel. Isaac, great to see you, and I need one of those sweatshirts at some yeah. point. <laughs> um, I, I saw Karen Moynihan's um, name pop up in the chat. I don't know if she has joined us yet. Uh, so we're going to come back to her in a moment. But Tabitha Bull uh, is uh, somebody I only recently met. And in hearing her speak, I need to know more about her and get to know her uh, better. Tabitha, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Ani, Tabitha, Indigena Kots, Nipissing, Indigena Ba, Medjansi, Dodem. Good morning, all. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Tabitha Bull. I'm a member of Nipissing First Nation. Uh, I am the president and CEO of Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. We are a national not for profit membership association. Uh, we've been around almost 40 years and our mandate is to grow the indigenous economy through research, programming um, and connecting, making connections between indigenous businesses and, and non-indigenous businesses across the nation. So pleasure to be here. Eva, thank you very much. And I, yes, I, I do believe that Karen is, um, is Karen here yet? I am here, thank oh, you Oh, so wonderful, much. great. <laughs> it's Welcome. so amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. It's it's so great to be here with you and with Senator Paula Deacon and with Tabitha and Isaac and all of us really fighting the good fight to make sure that SMBs have access to capital. Fantastic. Great. Well, listen, let's let's jump right in. And I, I sort of stated the question a little earlier, but what are some of the longstanding barriers, problems, friction points uh, that BIPOC Canadians have had with the banking and payment uh, challenges? Uh, specifically small businesses, uh, rural remote communities. And I'd like to start with uh, Isaac and um, Tabitha, if you could uh, give me a, a, your, 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 your answer to that question. Yeah, no, I think the biggest um, barrier is access to information um, and representation on who is providing that financial services. And uh, we've seen that there's been some changes um, happening to make that access and that friction, make it frictionless. Um, um, especially for small businesses, because when you have access, lack of access to credit, um, you, you're now limiting the business to be able to grow their business, to be able to provide employment um, for, for more individuals within their company and to be able to scale and be and generate revenue. Um, so with Open Bank, those are the solutions that are and products that are being brought, brought forth. And we've seen that as there's lack of access to credit, you've seen the widening of, of discrepancy between between those in the BIPOC and marginalized communities and those outside it in terms of generational wealth, in terms of creation of wealth um, because of the lack of access uh, to credit. And once you start from lack of access to credit from a business point of view, that then bleeds on to lack of access to credit from a home ownership point of view, uh, which then bleeds to um, security uh, for that family. Um, so those are some of the impacts um, um, that, are, that are facing marginalized communities. Uh, Tabitha, what about from your perspective for uh, Indigenous uh, Canadians? You know, uh, if there's one thing that I know about sort of the, a relation, the relationship between Canada's banks and Indigenous Canadians, there's not a whole lot of there's not a whole lot of bricks and mortar banks in and around where Aboriginal Canadians live. Uh, is is open banking just by by its very nature, the fact that so much of it exists on our phones, is that uh, an immediate improvement of that relationship? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, Bank of Canada actually just came up with a study in 2021 looking at the distance between bank branches and, and business or banking business from First Nation communities and band office. And the mean distance uh, from a cash source to a band office is around 100 kilometers. So definitely uh, open banking is going to provide an opportunity. But I think the other part is, you know, there's been... Uh, racism within the banking institutions. There's a uh, bias that exists that, you know, might be intentional or <laughs> unintentional. Uh, so just that, just getting over that bridge of going into a banking institution or going into a branch when you've not had a relationship with a financial institution before um, is a hurdle in itself and building that relationship. So not just traveling to the bank, but 
actually going in and asking for a loan. Yeah. Um, when you don't have a, a relationship with a bank or maybe your family hasn't had a relationship with a bank. Uh, indigenous businesses in Canada, only about 30% of them actually have a relationship with a traditional financial institution and a little less than a third are actually unbanked. So, uh, you know, as Isaac said, that kind of builds on itself. Even when we saw COVID support come out, they required that you already had a relationship with a financial institution. So for a number of Indigenous businesses, they weren't able to access some of those standard uh, loans and grant programs because they didn't have that relationship already. So I think open banking um, definitely can be a solution to that barrier. Uh, Isaac, I'd like to go back to you for a moment because, you know, in your introduction, you talked about how, you know, you and your organization, the people you work with, uh, have been actively working with uh, financial institutions to build those opportunities uh, for members of the Black community. So, so you're, you, you have those relationships with those, with, um, with sort of traditional banking. Um, talk to me about what you anticipate seeing in a world of open banking. What, how are those relationships going to change? Absolutely. And I think the, the key word and Tabitha mentioned is, is relationship and institutional relationship. Um, you could have transactions at an institution, but if you lack that core relationship, um, it's not going to be a transaction that you feel comfortable with, a transaction that you feel happy with, and a transaction that will help you grow um, to your benefit. Uh, with open banking, it, it, it gives more flexibility. Um, it allows for that customized relationship and that understanding of who is on the other side and getting an understanding what they actually need and what are those needs and customizing um, those needs. So I think that's where the relationship needs to go. And that's what we've been trying to do uh, within our organization is going in within those institutions and try to first bring representation and understanding of who they actually want to do the transaction with. Because if there's not an understanding of the background of that community or that individual, the challenges that they may face, um, then the product that are being provided will not fit. Um, one product can fit all boxes. Um, and especially when you're talking about new immigrants, when you're talking about families that may be with single family um, household, uh, families that may not have access to credit to begin with, families that are renting, um, the, the products that they may need and the relationship that may need will be different um, from other communities. And those that are providing that product, if they're not aware of it, um, it's hard to provide that solution. Um, I'd like to go to the Senator right now. We're talking about sort of historical mistrust between marginalized communities and, and these big Canadian institutions. And there's no bigger Canadian institution than the government and you, sir, sit in the Senate. When you hear these, when you hear these things, as somebody who's, who's you know, very close to the seat of power, what, what does that make you feel? Well, um, often, so the Senate is there to challenge government, especially yeah. in its new form. Independent senators are, are not there representing the opposition or the government. They're there to, to can we make the system work better? And I just, I, I go back to what uh, was just said er, er, earlier, and I'm still uh, digesting Tabitha's point that, the, that it's an, an average of 100 kilometers to a source of cash for our First Nations communities. Uh, you know, that, that just has so many implications to it. And, 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 and those, are, those are systemic barriers. Uh, they're systemic barriers that exist because banks are located where the most people are. You know, so, but we, we got to deal with that. One of the challenges I had is in the decisions around issuing CERB, the decision was only to work with banks and credit unions, not with fintechs. It was a very clear decision at Finance Canada that I found very frustrating because that was limiting to those who were among the banked and in our in our country. And I thought that was that was, you know, the people who needed the most help were the most marginalized. So we shouldn't be limiting in that regard. But that was a choice made by government. Uh, I think the opportunity here is to really address lack, areas where there are lacks of trust. We did a survey last year. Isaac helped the Senate in, in completing a survey of Black entrepreneurs and found that only 19% of Black entrepreneurs currently trust the banks. Now, that, that trust level tripled where there was a relationship, just to reinforce a point he made. You know, where there is relationship and representation, there can be trust much more easily than, than, than where it doesn't exist. But what I found most troubling is that 
up to, of black entrepreneurs didn't know where to find ten thousand dollars. Didn't think there was any chance they could access ten thousand dollars. And the majority of businesses were were uh, being financed through credit cards and savings. That meant those businesses were set up to fail. Yeah. Right from the get going. So that those are the sorts of systemic barriers. And what I don't like is when we spend our time focusing on banks being the problem. I like to focus on open banking being the opportunity. Yeah. Our banks are serving the customers they want to serve. But let's remove those moats around the banks that protect them from made in Canada uh, competition and allow those who want to serve other communities to come forward with the sorts of solutions that make lives easier and address these issues right out, you know, at, at, at their source and create systemic solutions that address the systemic barriers that have been there. I'd like to bring uh, Karen Moynihan in. She's the CEO of Boss Insights. And I mean, she's, she's like, she's the, the, the queen, the boss of data. Uh, talk to me, Karen, about, you know, the role that data can play in solving some of these systemic problems. Thank you, Ben. And I'm now going to introduce myself like that and say that Ben Mulrooney said it. So that, that's how it's going <laughs> from now on. I, you know, data is the Achilles heel of bias. That's what we always say. We're not talking about fundraising and equity. We're talking about debt. All we really need to show is that businesses have enough money to pay back what they're borrowing. It's a much less risky endeavor. And there's, if you can just take a numerator and divide it by a denominator, you're, you're good to go. So it doesn't make sense that less than 20% of the funds for COVID went to any kind of minority business. and. It doesn't make sense that most visible minorities didn't even want to report demographics because they have a trust issue. When you talk to the CEO of First Women's Bank, she says 4% of the dollars go to women. Uh, if you talk to FACE, there are 15,000 black owned businesses, entrepreneurs at, vying for capital because they want to get access to that capital. The solution here is data. It's, and, and to Senator Colin Deacon's point, it's collaboration. You need to have the business owners trust the service providers so that they want to share their information and trust that they'll do right by them. So if you see sales information that's verified on a business, if you see their accounting, their, their financial statements, and understand that they're building something, then you can take a bet on them. And, and then diversity is, is more about what specific services do you need because of the type of business you're running versus what do you look like? Which I think we can all agree, that's not the point. The point is to invest in the largest asset that Canada really has, which is small and medium businesses. That's our future. Um, I, my next question is gonna be a jump ball. So anybody who wants to take this, feel free. And if, if everybody wants to, to get in on it, uh, absolutely feel free. You know, when I was first introduced to the concept of open banking, I was told that it was, it was having a tough time gaining a foothold in Canada because people didn't understand what it was. Uh, they had a, a misapprehension and misunderstanding about what it actually even meant. And then I, I thought to myself, well, not only do people have a, a misunderstanding of open banking, but there's very few people in Canada actually understand banking generally. And, and, and so, and it leads me to my question about um, financial literacy um, and, 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 and the, the role that, uh, that open banking and these new fintechs and, and the banks, as, as uh, Senator Deacon said, can play in empowering all Canadians, but more specifically marginalized Canadians in taking control of their financial destiny through financial literacy. Who wants to take this one? I'll dive in. Uh, what I love is how innovative some of these products have, be have been, not just in Canada, but globally, that we've seen that have come out of fintechs that actually turn improving your credit score into a daily activity that you're coached on. So you're getting just-in-time learning. It, you know, it, the amount of learning, as somebody who spent a lot of time in adult education in the past, the amount of learning that happens uh, off to one side and never gets integrated into your daily practices is massive, right? We, we learn something that's interesting, but it, it drops out of our brain as we get on with the rest of our life. These apps that, that can help an individual know how, what they need to do and when and how 
as they need to do it, that just-in-time learning can fundamentally shift their lives and train them how to improve their credit score so that now when they do need that access to $10,000 worth of credit, they've got the data, as Karen said, and it's, and, and, and the, the, the challenges that Isaac and Tabitha were speaking about, they've got the data to prove that they're a good credit risk. And I want to give you an example about how this has actually already happened. The Philadelphia Fed did an analysis looking back 10 years, comparing the, the FICO score, which is the credit, main credit score used in the United States, of those who, who were borrowing uh, uh, based on, on, uh, on, on traditional bank lending policies and those who were borrowing through fintechs. And what they found is that over time, the fintech algorithm identified uh, that half of those who were uh, deemed as being uncredit worthy based on traditional analysis were in fact invisible prime borrowers, according to the, the Philadelphia Fed. And that is a phenomenal term. These are individuals that don't have wealth. They don't have high income, but they are not going to renege on a loan. They are going to, they are a very sure risk based on their data and their performance. And for me, that's, that's, that's a key place to start. I'll hand it over to the others because they got better examples. I'd love to jump in here if I yeah. can. I, when you're giving a person, a business access to capital, you're doing so on the basis of their financial data. Open banking asks the question, who owns that? Because right now, businesses, people are sending it into banks and the discussion of open banking is, should that be a shared asset? Is it owned by the business? Is it owned by the bank? How do you get access to it outside? And the thing is, open banking takes the position that the business owner should get access to their financial information whenever they want for whatever purpose they want. Here's why that helps the service provider. Right now, to get access to capital, you're giving over some financial data. And if you're doing it manually, it takes a long time to process. But if you're doing it digitally and you proactively suggest products to help business owners, to help people, and you show them their own data that they can take elsewhere, they're a stronger business. They're a stronger consumer. Right now, everything is an expense, which means you have to get that information to process that request, and it's a cost of doing business. Open banking is saying it's an investment. This means that you will have a clear picture of that one business, that one consumer, and the whole portfolio, so you can take better risks, so you can figure out who's being overlooked. And it's already showing dividends for any economy that's adopted it. So the question isn't really why it should be done, but how and when to best boost the economy. Tabitha, yeah, let's talk about uh, financial literacy uh, in, in, in um, First Nations communities. What good is a tool uh, if the people who it's given to um, don't know how to use it? Like, you know, if, if, you, if, you, are, if you are not empowered uh, to understand the products that are in front of you, um, and the, the options that are in front of you, then do you really have any options? Yeah, and I think, you know, to what Isaac said as well, those products can't be one size fits all. So particularly if we look at um, First Nation businesses on reserve, uh, because they don't own the land of the reserve, uh, very difficult for anybody in a First Nation community to get a mortgage. Um, definitely seen as higher risk to a bank because they don't have collateral, they don't have the land or the property um, to hold. So we need to look at unique situations in order to be able to support uh, Indigenous businesses. Specifically, this is like on a on an on reserve example, and we've definitely found ways, and banks have found ways to do that with support of the community. But then that include that adds on other layers of complexity as well. So when we think about tools and financial literacy, um, we need to ensure that those tools are made that fit the exact scenario that we're talking about. But then, you know, we also, you know, to think about that access to, to financial literacy or training or education um, and an accessible tool that really works. And that, you know, that becomes a barrier even just applying for any type of grant where you have to have like an immediate cash flow statement or an immediate business case. And that happened, you know, over the course of the pandemic as well. Uh, the ability to be able to have a tool where you can quickly 
develop a cash flow statement for your business in a time of uncertainty would be a huge uh, benefit to businesses to be able to then access further funding that's available. And, and we do see financial literacy, financial support around capacity um, in the financial space is one of the big asks of digital entrepreneurs and, and indigenous youth. I mean, I know we're all this is we're talking about this across Canada with youth in schools. My son is in grade eight and uh, finally starting to do like, what does a house cost? And what does it cost to like do groceries for a week? And that like just that general understanding is so important for our youth today as yeah. well. Isaac, let's finish up with you. Yeah, no, I think financial literacy is, is so critical, but I think Karen mentioned it is, is the data. Um, by having financial literacy, you start creating that data. And then from a location point of view, if you're going into those communities, you know, when I look at within the GTA, you look at Toronto Community Housing, all those different pockets, uh, what Open Bank allows is for customization and be able to go to the individuals, to the communities that are lacking the access, that are not close to the digital, that are not close to the physical banks, um, and they're not seeing representation when they actually enter those banks. And then they feel they don't have that relationship they could build. Um, so financial literacy, going into those communities, looking at the daily practices that those individuals are doing and how that could link to driving up their credit score the non-traditional way. Uh, because again, the only way to provide solutions to a system that hasn't worked for a certain group is, is looking at it a non-traditional way. Um, and that's what a, on, um, open banking is allowing for. Um, Canada has uh, was early to the party talking about how open banking was the future, that this was something that we were going to do. Uh, we are not there yet. Uh, and so the there are case uh, studies around the world as, as to the advantages of it, the benefits of it. Um, so the question is why? Senator? Um, I think there's a culture in Ottawa that doesn't reward risk taking. And that's very dangerous in a world where the system isn't working for everybody and where there's a lot of innovation and competition coming from outside of the country. But risk taking is not rewarded in Ottawa. You make a mistake and your career is a as a politician and as a public servant, I'm lucky in the Senate. It doesn't doesn't cha change it for me. So I decide to take a few more risks than others do. Um, but it's it, it, it's hard. It's very hard uh, from that standpoint. The culture does not embrace risk. Risk is essential to improving our society. It's essential to solving big, hairy problems. And we've got a lot of big, hairy problems in this country. And we've got to start figuring out processes that, that give enough comfort in Ottawa for Ottawa as a, as a, as a culture to, to embrace risk. Um, you know, you can say very easily, oh, these are dangerous little fintechs and they don't manage data properly and we've got to manage all these risks. And certainly when the Senate started studying open banking, the Canadian Bankers Association said the big concerns are, you know, risk to consumers, protection of data. All, they, they listed a number of different things that are already issues within our, our, our country. It's, of course, they've got to be managed. It's not, we can't assume that the state we have is perfect. What we have to assume is the state we have needs to constantly be improved. And that requires embracing risk. So the only question is, then how do you manage it? And you don't manage it by making huge changes all at once. You manage it by, by making incremental changes. And what we've seen is five, you know, five million Canadians or so are already using financial technologies. So we know where the challenges are. Accreditation should be a, a, an important issue. Well, I think that's probably number one in the hands of our open banking lead to ad address issues of accreditation because no, finan no VC, uh, no uh, major investor wants to be investing in a fintech that is not operating responsibly. So an awful lot of them will already have no issues. I think the vast majority of the successful fintechs will not have issues in terms of achieving very high standards in terms of accreditation. But we've got to, get, we've got to address the reality of where our systems are at, not assume what we have today is perfect. And what we have in banking today in Canada is not perfect. It's great. We've got some great stable banks, world leading, very competitive, but let's make them compete at home and make sure that those who are not being served by the system can be served by those who want to serve them. You know, and, and uh, we've got to stop having it where Canadians have to pay increases in fees based on what the banks want to improve, not the value, increased value they deliver. Yeah. 
So that would be my summary. Yeah. <laughs> um, Isaac, let's go to you. you you've sat across from the, the banks in, in your relationships with them. And, and, and I, I think it's really important to, to, to keep in mind what the senator said off the top, that it shouldn't be viewed as a uh, us versus them uh, dynamic. Um, how do you think, Isaac, uh, knowing them the way you do, uh, how, how, do, how do you get how do you get buy in from the banks? How do you get them to appreciate that it's not us versus them? It's it's a we situation. Yeah, I think, again, it's, it's just providing that understanding of that the reason why these products and solutions are being brought forth is because there's been years, decades of systemic problems and, and is very obvious when you look at businesses within marginalized and underrepresented communities, when you look at access to capital, access to homes within these communities and other communities, the biggest issue is the representation and the biggest issue is the products that's being presented. So I think it's an understanding of why the solutions are being um, put forth and how there's a collaborative nature as well too. Um, that is not one or the other, um, but using this product as a way to bridge the gap and say, okay, this is a solution that um, um, are able to be provided that maybe the banks aren't able to do. Um, and they're trying to do it, but as it is right now, it, it hasn't been done. And now new solutions are being uh, forth. So it's, okay, how can we collaborate with that new solution? How can we help? Because the end result really is to change a group and a community, whether it's the Aboriginal community, the Black community, and other underrepresented communities, to, to gain access to something that's been helping many other Canadians to be able to thrive. And, and I think that's really what the, the message is uh, when, when talking with the institutions. Uh, Tabitha, I can't turn on my television or listen to the radio without hearing an ad from, from one of Canada's banks. Um, and it seems to me, at least from the position of the consumer, that, they're, that they are aware that there are things that need to change as it relates to their relationships with uh, BIPOC Canadians. Um, is that your sense um, uh, as, as, uh, as, as someone on the front line that they've recognized as a problem that they're working on it? And do, you think that that, do, do you think that that's enough to, uh, to sort of open a dialogue and get them to buy into this concept that, that, that open banking is an inevitability and they should probably get on board? Yeah. Uh, definitely, I think I see that the major banks are really trying to work better. Uh, and from a perspective of large projects in community or large businesses in community, I think we're really moving in that direction. But the Indigenous small, medium business owner, uh, we're not really getting to solutions there. But I've had some good conversations with major banks about what they can do to to be better and what they need to do to move forward. But I think this, you know, it's not just government as Senator Deacon said, that's concerned about risk. It's, it's banks. They have like a very high risk register and it's almost about changing their mindset about who's a risky investor and who isn't. And, and open banking is, uh, will allow that to happen without, as Karen said, like no matter what the person looks like. Um, but I think we have some work to do on the consumer side as well for consumers to really understand what in open banking is. And, and I think on that risk conversation, when you say open banking or open data, um, I think for the average consumer, that's a scary thing. That's like, where's my data going and how is it? I don't want it to be out there in the ether. So I really, I think we have some work to do on that end to have the consumers really push for what they want from that perspective. But, but I do see a really good appetite right now with uh, the larger financial institutions and credit unions as well to really support. I mean, there's a huge opportunity there. There's 60,000 indigenous businesses in Canada. We're the fastest growing demographic in the country. Um, that's a lot of, that's yeah. a lot of clients that they're missing out on if they don't uh, bridge that gap. Uh, well, I've been told to be very mindful of the clock, and it says uh, that we've got just uh, under uh, half an hour left. I think we're going to keep about 10, 15 minutes for questions at the end. So we've got about 15 minutes left. And I think I want to um, look at, you know, we've, we've looked at the fintech side, we've looked at the banking side, um, uh, and, and, and Senator Deacon touched on the risk aversion of Ottawa. But what are some of the public policy challenges? Where, where are the friction points in Ottawa beyond this notion that, uh, that Ottawa is a risk averse place. Um, it, what are some of the actual nuts and bolts issues in Ottawa that we could 
that, that, that can be um, that can be dealt with. And, and I, I'm going to throw it out there, the situation that we're in today, there is a stable minority government for the next three years, um, theoretically. Uh, you know, we're, we're not worried about going back to the polls and, and, and changing course. We, we could see a policy grow, be enacted because there's enough runway here. Um, so where are those friction points? I guess, Senator, we'll start with you again. Um, I would highlight the open banking framework is underway. Fantastic. They've got a great playbook provided to the minister through the advisory committee that, that was formed. Um, but we need data portability. Canadians need to have the right to have access to their own data and choose who uses it for what reasons and for how long. And that's that's a, a crucial element in a, in a, in a digital economy, uh, which the world has become a digital economy very rapidly, is to have that control. So that we need our new privacy legislation in Canada. And I, I, I'm hearing rumors that it's getting close. So that's really good news. But the other thing that we really need to look at in Canada is, is competition policy. Uh, as it is, exists in our competition law, but also our policies across departments that are in many cases quite anti-competitive. We've had a real deference towards big business in this country, and we saw a study come out from the Canadian Centre Center for Policy Alternatives this morning that speaks to the excess profit scene over the last couple of years in certain industries, banking leading the way. You know, we, we had, for example, uh, banks increase fees during the pandemic at the same time as, as record profits and record executive bonuses and increased dividends and increased share buybacks. So, it, but there wasn't for those increased fees, increased value delivered. That's because there isn't enough competition. You know, I don't want to see to, to the point that we got a second ago, banks forced to deal with groups that they have not naturally been tending towards dealing with that, that are not their, yeah. their natural clients. I want to see others come forward to say, that's the group I want to deal with. And I want to deliver incredible value for money for that group because I see that as being a, a huge opportunity. But our competition laws in this country and competition policy have not opened up markets to create a level playing field for new entrants to compete with incumbents. So to me, competition in Canada is the other really big issue we have to deal with to make sure that Indigenous entrepreneurs, Black entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs from every corner of our country have the right to come forward and compete on a level playing field in a sector where there have been dominant incumbents in the past. Um, I, um, I, I, while you were speaking, Senator, I, I, something popped in my head, and I'm going to do my best to try to stumble into a question here. Um, but it, it, it occurred to me as, as we've been talking about these systemic barriers that have, that have been placed uh, in front of marginalized communities and different cultural communities in Canada, um, as it relates to um, financial institutions and this new world of of, of financial technology that exists on our cell phones, it occurs to me that one of those systemic uh, barriers is access to affordable Wi-Fi, uh, access to affordable um, cell phones. And it seems to me that that, is, that could be a choke point for fintech companies uh, as they want to get into, um, uh, as they want to serve marginalized communities. If they don't have, if those communities don't have access to affordable Wi-Fi, or if they're living in a in a, in a dead zone where their cell phone doesn't work, I don't know that their phone is a brick. Um, and so I'm wondering what everyone's thoughts are on that. I agree. Uh, you agree? <laughs> uh, Tabitha, what, Tabitha, what are your thoughts? What do we need to do to address that? Yeah, I think, I mean, high speed and reliable internet is really, I think we saw over the last two years becoming a necessity, uh, not just for, uh, for banking, but for businesses, for online school, for, for youth to be able to, uh, you know, get the education that they deserve equally, uh, and you know, there I I would say there are actually, you know, Wi-Fi and mobile providers that are also understanding that they have a role to play to support uh, entrepreneurs in in that space by providing um, more reasonable mobile um, fees and and supporting just from a device perspective as well. Um, but I think. I think the other piece about that is, is you know, mobile is great, but uh, just Wi-Fi. So if I'm in a community and I have to go to the band office to use the internet, because that's where the best internet is in the community, am I going to want to go there and do my banking? Like that's a bit, that's a very private, uh, you know, it's the same as like going there to apply for a loan or, you know, that's a, that's a private thing that you're doing. So 
so for sure, I think we need to ensure that we're getting high speed internet broadband into communities and not, you know, this isn't just remote communities. Uh, my, I'm from Nipissing First Nation. It's about a 15 minute drive from North Bay. And if I'm there trying to be on a WebEx call and it's not, I'm not having my camera on and, you know, 15 minutes down the street, I could get into easily uh, downtown in North Bay have much better Wi-Fi. So it's definitely uh, a conversation about not just remote, but rural communities as well. Yeah. Isaac, uh, Isaac, do you find um, do you find yourself agreeing with with uh, what Tabitha just said? Yeah, no, I think access obviously that's technology, right? I think that's um, regardless of where you are um, uh, within different regions, um, access to um, to Wi-Fi, access to the infrastructure required to be able to to utilize banking because you know that again, this is where the benefit of open banking is, uh, where through smartphones you're able to make payments, do transfers, um, do transactions, um, and really reduce the friction is um, of actually going to a physical a physical location. But that could only happen um, if that um, infrastructure is in place. Um, uh, Karen, uh, in, in the year 2000, a friend of mine started a website uh, that was going to be a massive success. Um, I signed up a whole bunch of clients um, and raised a whole bunch of money. Um, and when he was doing his market research, forgot to ask the one question that he, he should have asked, did the clients that he signed up have computers? And had he asked that question, they would have said no, uh, because once he turned on his service, none of them used it because they didn't have computers. And that speaks to a technology gap. Um, what are your thoughts on this technology gap? And you know, could this be a problem uh, for, uh, for uh, you know, fintech companies that want to serve underserved communities? The larger question I hear you asking is, how do we go about meeting the people and the business owners where they're at, right? Because right now we've forgotten that financial services has the word services in it. The way I was trained and I was at a big Canadian bank is that people would come to me and they come prepared with a nice, nice neat little package that they'd email to me at that time or now we're all in digital banking, so they'll upload unless they are in 15 minutes outside North Bay, in which case they can't. But the whole concept of the customer has to come to you prepared and armed with what they need and how to get it completely flies in the face of financial services. Scotiabank came out with a saying, you're richer than you think. I didn't hear a single comment about checking accounts, saving accounts, loans, credit cards. It was just customer focused. And I remember feeling very hopeful then. I feel really hopeful now too though, because now we have a whole bunch of new players. We're talking about big banks and tech providers, but there's a whole bunch of new incumbents coming on the scene to provide these services. I think that more than anything will move the dial forward. And do we need access to internet and things to actually make that happen? Of course, all of this can be done in partnership it's all cheaper than it ever has been to serve these customers. So we owe it to ourselves to collaborate. And if any player has the solution, say, I have the solution, and then collaborate together to get to market to make sure that it's customer focused, whether it be about internet connection, a checking account, a loan, a credit card, a payment solution that doesn't make a business owner want to pull their hair out, anything. We've got to make sure that we meet the customers where they're at. Senator, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. So I always am trying to look for, for the positives. And, you know, as I said before, Canada was very quick to champion open banking, a little bit slow to the party, but could that be a, a, a net positive for Canada in that we are able to look at the case studies around the world and pick and choose the best things that we need for our particular circumstance in Canada, especially as it relates to BIPOC? I, I think that's absolutely a great observation, Ben. There's been a lot done in Australia, a lot done in the UK, Europe, you, you name it. There's Brazil. I mean, there's a lot of countries that have been moving ahead rapidly. We can, we can learn from that. But the biggest thing we need to learn from is to stay focused on the needs of Canadians. Just to go back to Karen's point, let's not focus on the institutions 
Let's focus on what can all Canadians need in order to succeed and make sure that there is an option available to them. And, you know, this, the, this problem of connectivity is actually, it's a big, hairy problem that should create opportunity for Canadians. We don't need to have everybody wired. Why are we, we used to be leaders in satellite technology. You know, Telsat in the 80s was was a leading organization. Now it's Elon Musk. Well, let's figure out a way to 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 get that connectivity, regardless of our geography. We can do it. The, the technology exists. And if we are consumer centric, we can t- take each one of these issues and start to advance them. So that's why I believe so much in competition, because competition forces organizations to identify their customers and the differentiated value they deliver. And that's what we need to enable in this country more and more. So I'm with you. Glass is half full. There's a lot we can learn from. And as long as we say customer centric, consumer centric, we can make a lot of progress. I'll stop. So, so to, to, to dovetail off of what the senator just said in terms of focusing on what the consumers need and, and in this panel, we're, we're looking at, you know, specifically uh, minority groups, um, uh, marginalized groups. So uh, Tabitha, in your role as the CEO of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, uh, have, you, have you heard from, from your members about what their needs are um, and, and, the, and the possibility that maybe open banking could, could fill some of those needs? Definitely. I think, uh, I mean, at this point and during the last uh, two years, it's more about like, we don't want more loans, <laughs> but <laughs> that's just where I think most small medium enterprises are right now. Um, but definitely a perspective from a relationship, as we said, from the top, it's really about how do we build that trust and relationship with the banking institution and, and where are the services for indigenous or underrepresented uh, small businesses. So as I said, we've, we've made some really good strides for larger First Nation owned or economic development corporations uh, with banks and all of the major banks have made some really great strides at building those relationships, but, but unique products for the small, medium businesses. And, and also who do they go to? Like, who's their connection within a bank? Do they go to the banking that's more for their sector or they go to the indigenous banking section of the bank? That, that part and just getting to know the person that's the best to serve them within a bank is something that uh, businesses are saying is really needed. Uh, so through an open banking system, if they're not having to find that one person that's there, you know, specifically looking at how to support them, we can see some improvement there. Uh, but that's where, you know, on the consumer side, I think we haven't had a lot of discussion specifically with um, our members on open banking. It, I, it really hasn't come up a significant amount. So I think that's where we need to do some more education on what the opportunities are. Oh, I think you're muted, Ben. You're right. I was muted. I apologize. Um, I'm looking at the clock. It says 11.01. And oh, I think I've got a question here. Hold on. Yeah. So, so I said that we were going to go to questions around 11 or uh, 11, uh, 05, 11, 05, and uh, I've got a question here from an anonymous attendee, and feel free to keep these questions coming in. Um, how would accreditation compare to regulation? Existing financial institutions are overly regulated, and yet fintechs are not, not a, leving, not a level playing field for FIs. Um, so who would like to answer that? I'll gladly dive in to begin. Uh, one thing I've noticed in Ottawa is how slowly things move. And if, if your regulation and legislation move re- really slowly, you're not keeping up with changes in business models and technology or gaps in, in need in our economy. And so the beauty of having accreditation that is standards-based, uh, so we've got, for example, uh, standards being developed that, that, that drives certification or accreditation. The beauty of having that is that they can be open to the community that is, that is driving that. And those can guide. They're like a, to me, they're like the road with the, found, you know, the, the, the gravel base and, and good hard top and, and ditches and drainage. That's the standards are like the road. Government can then put up stop signs and speed limits and guardrails as needed to protect the public and when they use that road. But standards provide that foundation. Um, right now, we still haven't had banks calling for uh, open banking, which will bring in 
uh, new uh, open APIs that, that, that can allow data to be shared very safely that will bring in accreditation. Um, they've, they've not been fans of that. So you can't call for, um, say that it's an unfair situation, but not call for change. Right, that, that, that brings that. And I just hope, in not just in banking, but across the board, that we have more standards-based regulation frameworks because they can be more agile and allow Canada to become much more competitive. If our regulations don't change, they prevent our businesses from innovating. They really constrain that. And if we prevent our businesses from in innovating, we're preventing c consumers from getting access to the most valuable cost-efficient services. Uh, does anyone else uh, want to jump in on that regulation? Because uh, I, I, I can speak, if I can take my moderator hat off for just one moment, I cannot speak on behalf of uh, the entire fintech community, nor even if I could, I don't, have the, <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have the gravitas to do so yet. But I do know that in the conversations that we have around our, our uh, leadership table, that we, we welcome um, uh, regulation. We, we, we want to be part of, of that, uh, that community of, of regulated businesses. I think it's a validation. Uh, that, that we would invite. Um, I'll put the moderator hat back on. Uh, anyone else want to oh, jump in on this one? I, I was once also asked, and I have no uh, deep expertise in regulation to comment on what would make it better. And I suggested that regulators should go and spend a week in the life of a fintech and fintechs should go and spend a week in the life of regulators, just so each party could see what the other is dealing with. There's a reason for regulation and there's a benefit to it. There's a balance to it so that it makes it possible to move things forward. All of, all of these things are, are small hurdles to overcome, I would say. We're, Voss Insights is a data aggregator, a data provider. We do a SOC 2 level 2 study, which means CPA firms who are regulated look at every single aspect of our business, not just the product, to give it that stamp of approval. It's like Nexus if you were traveling. And, and so you can go and do that, right? That's a hurdle that you can overcome. I think the challenge is, is that these things are being used as reasons why things are not moving forward and the world is moving forward anyway. We're here anyway. And, and I just, I, I thank everyone who's put their hat in the ring. I mean, Senator Colin Deacon, you've been giving so much uh, voice to this issue for so much time for so many years saying, why aren't we doing better? We can do so much better. If you take the fintechs, you have the entrepreneurial spirit. There's no challenge that cannot be overcome, right? If you take the Canadian banks, they have the expertise at full service relationships. All the neo banks, all the, all the new players who are coming into the market are going to be the best of both worlds taking the latest in fintech. We all have to work together. Because what I keep hearing echoing in my head is what Tabitha said. If I'm an Aboriginal person, if I'm an Aber a First Nations business owner, where do I go? And right now, there's no clear roadmap. If it, there, there really isn't. In fact, as a former banker, you'd think I would know where to go, and I don't. And my existing banking relationship, when I needed to do FX, told me point blank, we're not the best provider for you. So we all acknowledge this privately. It's time to publicly come to the table and get this done. That's great. Thanks, Karen. Um, anybody else? Isaac, you want to touch on this? Regulation? Regulation fintechs? Um, I, think, I think both uh, Karen and the uh, center said, said a lot on it. It's it to me. It's one of those things that drives the the uh, organizations to find new new ways of dealing with old problems, and that's what we need in this country. And it's uh, we cannot have static systems, and uh, and, and it's we've got we we're seeing how static systems are not serving too many important communities in our country. And that's so that's for me. It's a passion project, but it's uh, to convince Canadians to be interested in competition law. That's a tough sell. <laughs> 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 well, I've been, uh, I've been inviting people to give us uh, ants. Oh, here's another question. Oh, great. Uh, fantastic. Okay. Here's another one from uh, an anonymous attendee. How would you each describe success for open banking in Canada in underbanked communities? So we, what's one metric that, uh, that you, you could give us? And we'll start, uh, I think we'll start with uh, Karen and we'll go around the horn. Karen, what's one metric by which you would say, if we can achieve that, it, uh, open banking is a success in marginalized communities? So the success is driven simply by I'm a person, I'm a business owner, 
and I've had a hard time getting service and now I can. I need to solve my payment solution, I get it done. I need a loan, I get it done. And actually success should be that the financial institution that I choose is telling me based on my personalized information, what products I need to help me get ahead. Stop telling me about debt service coverage. I think that's a tougher self competition law and start telling me <laughs> you have the metrics to get a loan, click here. You have regular money coming in. So process your payments or do your payroll now, click here. That's success. Isaac, what about you? What, would, what will determine success uh, in open banking and in open banking world? I think the indirect impact to open banking is an increase in um, small businesses um, and growth and employment uh, because for, for businesses to be able to scale, uh, they need access to capital. Um, for mar marginalized and, and businesses within a black community, uh, we're the lowest percentage of businesses with, with employees. And um, to be able to scale with employees, uh, you need access to credit um, so that it can match the revenue that comes in. Uh, so with open banking, you're able to customize um, the solutions and product for those businesses and understand some of the challenges that they may already have and providing solutions um, to face those challenges and help them grow. Um, so I think once we start seeing those metrics, uh, we'll know that the solution is working. Tabitha, what about for you? What's that metric of success? Isaac took mine. <laughs> uh, I think, I think for sure. Sorry. I, um, you know, that this ability to scale and the ability to actually do that assessment as to when you scale, that's something that we see as a big hurdle for, uh, our, a lot of our members is just understanding like, okay, I need to grow. I can't run this business on my own anymore, but how do I know when to make that move? Um, I think it's also about like the time from when you decide you need investment or want to scale to the time when you actually get a signed agreement. Like that amount of time can be very discouraging for in small businesses who are trying to run their business at the same time. So some metric around like the time from when I decide I want to apply and the time when I actually sign on the dotted line. I think the other thing that just for consideration um, that we're, you know, having a lot of discussions about is how does a business understand uh, the values and how the values are aligned from their investor? So if we look at like a venture capital or, and, um, you know, and if it is a fintech and open banking, uh, where, what, where does that conversation fit in? So, you know, I've spoken to a lot of um, our members who are looking to scale and have, have had investors interested, but they don't align with their values. They don't align with the value as to why they started the business. So maybe that's a value of, of diversity in their employees or about giving back or the social perspective. And we see a very high percentage of uh, Indigenous businesses who have a social sustainable goals within their, their business. They want to ensure that whoever is investing maintains that or that they have control over continuing that. So, um, I mean, I don't have the answer, but I would be really interested to understand like how FinTech and open banking can answer that or, or support that as well. Well, we've got, uh, we only have just under five minutes left. So um, rather can than- I add, Can I add yes. one more little thing, Ben? Yes, Because yes, I'd love to if I could. Thank you very much. Um, for, I, for small business, what I'd love is as someone who used to, to build businesses, take an idea and turn it into opportunities and jobs and, uh, and prosperity, one of the things I hated most was the necessary evil of the administrative burden of my financial statements and my banking statements and reconciling everything and, and making sure that I had the resources to make payroll every two weeks. And the worst sleep I always got was on Wednesday nights when the ADP payroll would go out in the middle of the night and I'd be panic struck, you know, did that check clear in time because I could have had the money in the account, but the bank didn't uh, clear the check, even though often it was from their own bank um, in time for me to, to, to make payroll. So it's, it's services that help small business to manage the necessary evil of administering that business so they can focus on delivering value to customers. Like to me, that that's that's a huge measure of success. The more of those options that exist, the more competition that exists in delivering those options to small business people, the more excited I'll be. Secondly, in terms of consumers and marginalized consumers in particular, the fact that payday lenders will close on most, most 
um, corners will be a good thing because it means that there's services available that recognize uh, and help them recognize their needs and help them to prov- to not have to go and get into the spiral of very, very high cost borrowing because they've been trained through a good app on how to improve their credit scores, get access to cheaper credit, to not get too far in debt and to have a better chance of, of, of building their lives for themselves and their families. Senator, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you to everybody on this panel. I want to thank Senator Deacon, Isaac, Karen, and Tabitha, as well as Michelle for having introduced me. Uh, this has been a great way to, to kick off um, uh, uh, what's going to be a really great day for a lot of people.